we'll get started here. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I want to thank you for joining us. We're going to go through a lot in this lecture tonight. Our discussion is going to entail some physics, consciousness, near-death experiences, and God, and the relationship to our understanding of our universe, what I refer to as Universe 1.0. I also talk about what I refer to Universe 2.0, heaven. At the end, we're going to wrap it up with an introduction to a new way of viewing the universe. In the next lecture, we'll really get into what is reality. Through this, hopefully you may think of reality differently and have a greater appreciation for God. These lectures can best be described by a, my favorite quote, which is not that one. <laughs> okay. This is from Werner Heisenberg, one of the founders of quantum mechanics. When one drinks from the cup of scientific knowledge, one learns to question everything, and soon one becomes an atheist. By the time you reach the bottom of the cup, you are staring at God. That's what we hope to achieve over these lectures. This is another quote from someone who needs no introduction. Science without religion is lame, and religion without science is blind, from Albert Einstein. Now, for your homework, hopefully, some people didn't, you, you were able to, I asked you to watch three videos that were on our webpage, and I found most people didn't see them. Did most people watch those or not? You did? Okay. If you didn't, you might want to go back during the next week and watch them. If you go onto the web page and it says more information, there's three videos there. Um, the videos are on near-death experiences. A near-death experience is generally defined as someone who has died and has a transcendent experience. I will add that their consciousness has left their physical body. I hope you've been able to watch them, but I'll give you a brief summary. The first one was about Dr. Eben Alexander. Dr. Alexander was a Harvard-trained neurosurgeon who had a near-death experience. Sometimes I'll refer to near-death experiences as an NDE. Dr. Alexander wrote the best-selling book, Proof of Heaven. If what you hear tonight interests you, I recommend it. It's a simple, easy read. Prior to Dr. Alexander's near-death experience, if a patient stated that they had an out-of-body, transcendent experience while on the operating table, Dr. Alexander would have given them the standard scientific medical answer. The brain does strange things when we, we are dying, but he would not say that now, not after his own NDE. <laughs> Dr. Alexander had an acute form of spinal meningitis that ravaged his brain and placed him in a coma for over a week. He never should have survived, and if he did, he never should have fully recovered, yet he did. While he entered the coma, he entered another realm of the universe, what I'll refer to as universe point 2.0, or we can call it heaven. While there, he was guided by a woman he did not recognize. Obviously, this NDE had a profound effect on his life. After his NDE, he came, did quite a bit of research, turns out he was adopted, and he had a biological sister that he did not know about, a biological sister who died before he went into his coma. When he saw her picture after his near-death experience, he recognized that she was the one who guided him while in heaven. Now, this is an important point. This could not just be his biological, physical brain playing tricks with his subconsciousness because he had no earthly knowledge of her existence. The experience was purely transcendental, not a product of human consciousness contained only between our ears. The second video is a testimony of Ian McCormick. Now, Ian was, uh, was stung by five. He was a young, strapping surfer at the time. And an, if you watch the video, he was an atheist and had a conversation with Jesus and pretty much get converted when you have a conversation with Jesus. But anyway, anyway, he was stunned by five box jellies. One box jelly will kill a horse within a few minutes. He had an NDE and had been clinically dead for an estimated 15 to 20 minutes. His consciousness, his soul, came back into his body on the morgue table. The third video was about Dr. Sicoria. He was on the telephone when it was struck by lightning. If anybody over the age of 35, a telephone is a thing you hold in your hand. It's got connected to some wires and other one, right? Anyway, the lightning electrocuted him, and he then had an out-of-body experience. After his NDE, he began composing and performing symphonies. We'll get into that later. So 
we're going to t focus on consciousness tonight, but let's start talking about physics. So what is physics? Really, it's just the study of the motion of particles. That's it. Those particles can be a baseball, a rocket, a planet, or an entire galaxy. Those particles can also be very small, an atom or electron, for example. The world around us that we deal with can be described by what is known as Newtonian mechanics. Newton's classic paper, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, referred to as the Principia, the short Latin version, was published in 1687. From his basic principles come all the equations that describe the motion of the particles that we experience. As an engineer, everything that I dealt with came from Newtonian mechanics. The load on a building or how it moves in an earthquake. Those are all Newtonian mechanics. It describes the motions of particles if they're not approaching the speed of light. That takes special relativity. It does a reasonable job of describing the motion of planets. Fortunately, I never had to design a satellite GPS system that requires general relativity to account for the space-time differential. Without Einstein's general relativity, the GPS on your phone would not work. But neither one, Newtonian mechanics, special or general relativity, describes the motion of small particles, such as electrons and atoms. For that, you need the branch of physics described by quantum mechanics, which we will discuss briefly now. Quantum mechanics has some very odd properties, which should make us think or rethink about our understanding of the universe and reality. At the beginning of the 20th century, light was well known to be a wave. You will recall in elementary school that you showed a light through a prism and it reflected in the different colors of the rainbow and it comprised the, the frequency of light. This was a universally accepted natural law of nature. Light is a wave. Now back again in the 20th century, being at that time, one would have to have been an absolute idiot to say anything but light is a wave. Well, as you can imagine, there was such an idiot. In fact, he was just a lowly clerk working in the back room of a Swiss patent office. And in 1905, he wrote a paper that stated that light behaves as a particle. And it became in discrete quanta of energy. We now know that particle would be a photon, the basic element of the universe that transmits energy. Oh yeah, and the young clerk's name was Albert Einstein. And he did get a promotion though from clerk two to clerk three, and a few years later a Nobel Prize. But this began 25 years of research and collaboration among physicists to devise quantum mechanics. Numerous physicists, Wolfgang Pauli, Paul Dirac, Edwin Schroeder, Werner Heisenberg, Niels Bohr, to name a few. We now have an equation that describes the motion of small particles, kind of. It actually gives you the probability of where a particle is. If I threw a baseball back there towards the wastebasket in the back of the room, I said toward, not in, I was never a very good pitcher. Newtonian mechanics would describe mathematically the arc of the ball, its position, its direction, its mass, velocity, its momentum at any point in its arc. But if I fired a single electron that way, quantum mechanics could only tell me its approximate position, but not its velocity. Or its velocity, but not its position. We just don't know. Quantum act describes the probability of where a particle is or how it might behave. There are a lot of not unknowns. In fact, many would say it would take an infinite number of paths to the wastebasket back there, and the one that has the greatest probability would be the one that it would take once it's observed. In fact, Einstein, who started all this, never fully accepted quantum mechanics. He believed the universe should be deterministic. He did not like the uncertainty of quantum mechanics. Therefore, he thought quantum mechanics was an incomplete theory. This produced one of his most famous quotes, God does not play dice with the universe. To which the equally esteemed Dutch physicist Niels Bohr replied, Mr. Einstein should not tell God how to run the universe. <laughs> and it's actually Niels Bohr's interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is still used today. This is the most popular interpretation, is known as the Copenhagen interpretation. When I shoot the electron across the room, it's behaving as a wave. But once someone actually observes it, a human or macro observation, the wave function collapses and it becomes 
a particle. This is called wave particle duality. Okay, this is a bit weird. Human conscious observation changes the characteristics of a particle. A particle which is known as the basic element of the universe. This drives physicists crazy. It is known as the quantum enigma, the observer effect. The pure materialist will say it is only a change in its mathematical state, which is known as its eigenstate. But they still cannot explain the observer effect. There are two fundamental experiments that describe the unique properties of quantum mechanics. The double slit experiment, which we'll discuss in more detail briefly, and what is known as the EPR experiment. We'll discuss that in the next lecture. These highlight some of the unique properties of quantum mechanics and the quantum enigma. Property that, for the most part, scientists have avoided for the first 70 years of quantum mechanics because they just don't like what it implies. Only recently have a few tried to study or even think about the quantum enigma. Quantum mechanics does an excellent job of describing the quantum world. It is the most successful theory in physics. Physicists are content to utilize it as a tool without considering its broader implications. It's a very useful tool. We are going to focus on some of its broader implications tonight. Let's jump into a discussion of the double slit experiment real quick. If there was a television outside in the hallway and the television was on, we could hear the sound, but we could not see what's on the screen. Why is that? It has to do with the wavelength of sound versus light. Think of waves coming into a pier and hitting you know, an ocean. They hit the pier and they hit the pier and they break up and they kind of recombine behind it. That's because the ocean waves are similar in wavelength to that of the pier. So sound waves have a wavelength of about one meter. That's about equal to the width of the doorway. Therefore, the sound waves are diffracted going through the doorway and we can hear them in this room. Light has a wavelength of 10 to the minus seven meters, around 500 nanometers. So this is really small. We can see the wavelength diffraction of light if an obstruction itself is similar in size. This leads to what is known as the double slit experiment. This is actually first done by a British physicist in 1801. Young experiments proved that light was a wave. In the experiment, uniform light passes through two slits. Now think of it like the glass slide you'd used in high school and you paint it black and you were to take two razor blades and you squeeze them together as tight as you can and you just touch that thing. That's kind of the difference we're talking about here. If one shines uniform light on the double slit, the light goes through both slits and creates an interference pattern behind it. If we put a screen behind it, you can see the interference pattern. I will show this in a moment. Just like the slinky you played with, you know, the waves will, can either double themselves or, you know, if, they zero, if one, the trough meets the peak, they'll become zero. This is called constructive and destructive interference. This is what sh why you get this pattern. So here's like waves, you know, coming in to some rocks on the beach. And you'll see the waves come in and then behind it, all these other waves. Some place the waves are high and some place you have these lines here where it's zeroed out. Now, this is supposed to be a video that didn't work, but we'll talk about it anyway. In the video, the guy is hitting two balls and you, and you can see quite well the constructive and destructive interference. But you can kind of see a line going out that way, which is a destructive interfer interference. And this is the double slit experiment. So you have a uniform light source, it'll be S1. S2 is the two slits. The light goes through it, and then you can see where the waves interfere with each other. And then you have like a recording screen back here. And the light in dark, the light reflects where the, the waves increase, constructive, constructive interference, and the black correspond with destructive interference. So, so the waves are, so basically that proves the wave function of light. But what if the light is a single particle? Nowadays, with modern technology, you could actually shoot an individual photon one time at the double slit. You can actually do this with an electron also. As you might expect, you shoot one photon through, and when it goes through, it makes one dot on the screen. But if you do this over a long period of time, you start to build up a wave pattern, even though you are shooting individual particles. So you start at I, atom A, you know, you get one or two particles. As you start shooting one particle at a time, 
Pretty soon you get to D, and now you have an interference pattern. But you shot one particle through. Which slit did the particle go through? Technically, we don't know. It could actually go through both slits at the same time. One of the odd quirks of quantum mechanics. If it's a single particle, how does it interfere with itself? Some would say, and again, it has a number of infinite number of possibilities. Or we get in the latter part, some other people will say it doesn't exist until it's actually observed. But now comes the really odd part. Depending upon how you set up the experiment, you will see the pattern to be either a wave or a particle. But the really odd part is light behaves as a wave until there's an observation of it. Then it becomes a particle. This is known as a macroscopic observation, the wave particle collapse divided by Niels Bohr. Is it consciousness? For years, it's been thought of as consciousness, as cause the wave particle duality collapse. Now, an observation caused by interaction with the environment. This is the part of the mystery, that, again, that drives physicists crazy because they don't want to talk about the implications, which we'll get into tonight. I said there are other interpretations besides the Copenhagen interpretation, but there are still questions. All the early physicists who created quantum mechanics, Bohr, Heisenberg, Dirac, Pauli, all in one way or another stated that human observation consciousness collapsed the wave function. This Niels Bohr, one of the, who the, the grandfather of quantum mechanics, says, if you do not shock by quantum mechanics, then you do not understand it. <laughs> or this comment from Mark, uh, Max Planck. Um, his theory actually helped spur Einstein's original work, which is, we won't get into that, it's called the black body radiation. I regard consciousness as fundamental fundamental. I regard matter as a derivative of consciousness. So what he's saying, many people are saying that consciousness is fundamental to the universe, more so than matter. It's also can be interpreted as information. We'll get into that later. This phenomenon has been known for over 90 years, but has largely been ignored by physicists. Quantum mechanics is a te tested and extremely useful. So physicists utilize it as a tool, but tend to ignore the unusual properties. Quantum mechanics is used to design the silicon chips for computers or the lasers that scan your grocery. It's important for the technology that drives our economy, but also gives us some pretty strange answers to reality. Fortunately, we're not going to delve into the physical properties tonight. We're going to focus on consciousness. If it's confusing, don't worry. The great physicist Richard Feynman, who won his Nobel Prize for his work in quantum mechanics, made this comment. I can successfully, sta successfully state that no one understands quantum mechanics. And that was when he got his Nobel Prize. So don't, don't be confused. Don't worry about being confused. It is confusing. That was many years ago, and it's still true today. One researcher, Dr. Dean Redden from the Institute of Noetic Sciences, tried to prove the consciousness effect. Dr. Redden made a presentation in 2016 of his research in the double slit experiment and consciousness. In this experiment, they set up a double slit experiment using a laser. This is a photon experiment. One important thing to note, the experiment can be done with photons, electrons, atoms, even fairly large atoms. It's just a lot more expensive the larger the particle. The important thing is this applies to all the elementary particles of the universe. With a laser, the experiment can fit on a shelf. Radium placed the experiment in a metal room enclosure. This is to remove any vibration since technically that's an interferometer and there's sensitive vibration. Then he measured the wave pattern. They had a single volunteer sit in the room and concentrate on the double slit. Not actually observe it, but just to concentrate on it. We had several hundred volunteers do it. Just think about it. The experiment was set up so each volunteer would concentrate for plus or minus 20 seconds and relax for plus or minus 20 seconds. The timing was randomized. They found a significant shift in the wave function intensity. Interesting to note that they both used volunteers who practice meditation and those who don't. Those who meditate regularly did better because their minds don't wander. I wouldn't do very good because my mind wanders all the time. They then put the volunteers outside of the steel room and ran the experiment. Same results. They then put the process on the internet 
and had nearly a thousand people do it from all over the world. Same result. Human consciousness, thought, changed the behavior of the basic elementary particles of the universe, and they could measure it. In fact, it was a substantial measurement. Now, I have to explain the word substantial in this case. The effect itself was very small. The way actually the change, what she saw, was very small. But after several thousand subjects, they were able to confirm a five sigma differential. Sigma is the unit of measurement beyond the standard deviation. They ran all kinds of analytics on the data to confirm this. The measured effect is small, but the change over the standard deviation is great. They've also done this with random number generators, generators with amazing results. As Dr. Ragin likes to joke, people have won the Nobel Prize for obtaining a five sigma differential. The Higgs boson is an example. He has yet to receive a phone call from the Nobel Committee. It was a very significant, measurable, reproducible result. Human consciousness alters the behavior of the most elementary particles of the universe, matter. It actually has been known since the 1920s, just ignored. It was described by uh, Wolfgang Pauli, I think, in this way. It's my personal opinion that in the science of the future, reality will be neither psychic nor physical, but somehow both and somehow neither. <laughs> now, if you can make sense out of that, great, you know, but it's probably true. Okay. So what is human consciousness? This has been debated since the time of Socrates by many philosophers over the ages. Much theory began with the Christian philosopher Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, but the concept of consciousness was reintroduced in the 17th century by the French Enlightenment philosopher René Descartes, the father of modern philosophy. This began the subject of dualism. So Descartes essentially have the mind and the body. The body he is He's not speaking just our human body. He's talking about the body of matter, the universe, separate from our mind, the mind which thinks and provides consciousness thoughts. So really, when you see body, I'll use it in the next lecture too, we're talking about the universe. This produced his most widely quoted verse, I think, therefore I am. What you don't hear is the interpretation of his complete paper. The point he stipulates there is, I think, therefore I am, Therefore, God exists. Descartes rules out all experiential knowledge, knowledge from our senses, and a priori proves the existence of God because he can still think. The point tonight, though, is consciousness. In Descartes' time, the mind and soul were considered to be the same. We should study the soul. Unfortunately, Newton published his outstanding paper, The Principia, 40 years later right after this. Now, it's important to keep these dates straight. You don't want to put the Newton before Descartes. <laughs> <laughs> now, sorry. De Descartes suggested studying the soul. Newton defined the world as we see it mathematically. And the success pushed the nascent scientific community to study the body of matter, not the soul. And we've been doing that ever since. But back to consciousness. Now, I have read numerous papers and books on consciousness, many by the most esteemed scientists in the world today. And I can tell you unequivocally, almost every one of them is flat out wrong. Why? Because they all start with the exact assumption. Consciousness is created with the three and a half pounds of jello between our ears. Near-death experiences show us that consciousness exists after we die, it exists within us now, and is really a connection to God. As I stated in the beginning of this lecture, if you were a patient of Dr. Alexander, the neurosurgeon, before his NDE and told him, hey doc, while I was on the table, the stat sheets show I flatlined during that time I left my body, I could observe the world through multiple dimensions, he would have given the standard medical scientific answer. The brain does strange things when we die and we just don't understand why. But not now. Now you will concur that your consciousness left your physical body and traveled into a different universe or realm. If you went deep into that universe, a different universe, you would have met God. Many people have. 
to Dr. Alexander and many others, God is the center of the universe, the source of all knowledge and energy in our universe. An important point here. In fact, Dr. Alexander doesn't like the word God because he thinks it's an inadequate word to describe the entity which is the center of all knowledge and energy of our universe. Yeah, more on that in the next lecture. Studying brain engines are using functional MRI. Medical science can say a specific area of the brain affects language or social behavior, for example, but they cannot state where consciousness lies. There's no accepted scientific theory on consciousness or its origin. One of the popular theories today comes from Sir Roger Penrose, the famous Oxford physicist, and the University of Arizona anesthesiologist, Dr. Stuart Hamroff, both very smart guys. The Penrose Hamroff conscious mind theory proposes that quantum effects within the microtubules in the neurons of our brain act like a computer, aligning themselves in sort of a digital one and a digital one and zero configuration. This is known as orchestrated objective reductionism, or simply orc or. There are 80 to 90 billion neurons in our brain. In their theory, inside the microtubules in the neurons, there are the lined up quantum particles, again, like ones and zeros. Essentially, they treat our brain like a computer chip or a hard drive. And this is the origin of consciousness. Let's talk for a moment about Ian e. McCormick and his de near death experience. Ian was stung by five box jellies. One could kill a horse. He was clinically dead for an unknown period of time, but at least 15 to 20 minutes. And his soul, his consciousness, came back into his body on the morgue table. Dr. Sequoia was what we would call reversibly dead. When he was hit by lightning through the phone line, he fell on the floor right next to a nurse. She began CPR, and he was revived. Had there been no medical intervention, he would have been just as dead today as he, he was then. Medical intervention brought him back to life. He was reversibly dead. In Ian McCormick's case, there was no medical intervention. It was too late by the time he got to the hospital. Ian was irreversibly dead. Dr. Frankenstein could not have brought him back to life. His body does nothing more than a cold hunk of meat. That's what we become when we die. Yeah. Or in my case, more like a cold hunk of bacon, but that's different. The only reason his soul, his consciousness, returned to his body is because Jesus said, you are going back. Now, this is an example of primary causation, something that humankind has never been able to study, primary causation. Jesus said, you are going back. Now, if you haven't watched the video, I suggest you do, because, you know, this guy was, you know, this young strapping surfer, and, you know, he was dead on the morgue table and, you know, had a conversation with Jesus. That'll convert you in a hurry. And it did. So it's worth watching that video. Entities are not new. They have happened numerous times through recorded history. They are far more prevalent today now because of this, the, inter, the advancements in medical science. I suspect our cultural concepts in heaven and hell may come from NDEs over the ages. Lazarus was probably a big hit at first century Jewish cocktail parties. You won't believe where I've been, who I talked to, you know. Hey, I'm sure he was a big hit. We should be using near-death experience to study universe 2.0, to look at it cosmologically. We use telescopes to peer into universe 1.0. These telescopes can be ground-based or meeting today, such as the Hubble or James Webb now, we're in outer space, we use radio waves, we even have LIGO, which is to detect gravitational waves. So we should study near-death experiences to study universe 2.0, to look at it cosmologically. We use telescopes to peer into universe 1.0, and they're very sophisticated scientific instruments. These telescopes actually provide us with very little information, a small amount, but from this small amount of information, we're able to derive great knowledge. All right. In 1927, the Belgian physicist Georges Lemaitre wrote of the expanding universe using general relativity and working it backwards. He mathematically came up with the hypothesis of the primeval atom, what we now refer to as the Big Bang Theory. 
1929, two years later, Edwin Hubble determined that light from distant galaxies shifted down in frequency, which is known as the redshift. From this small amount of information, a slight shift in the frequency of light, he was able to prove that distant galaxies are moving away from us. This was the first evidence of Lemaitre's theory. From small bits of information, we derive great knowledge. In this case, just the frequency and the shift in visible light. This is why we should study near-death experiences, the physics of them. Near-death experiences are our telescopes in the universe 2.0, a totally different universe or realm, if you wish to call it that, than one which we now exist, or more correctly, I would say we perceive. Hundreds of thousands of people have traveled to an entirely different universe and come back. But since we call it heaven, their testimony tends to be ignored. But let's get back to consciousness, its origin. We'll start with a video of Dr. Sequoia. Now, the first interesting point in this video is Dr. Sequoia is a medical doctor, and he failed to diagnose his own death. Oops. Don't tell Dr. Bob that. Fortunately, when he was killed, there was a nurse standing next to him, and she was able to revive him. He had what would be described as an out-of-body experience. The interesting part is immediately after his recovery, he had this urge to listen to classical music, and then learn how to play it, and then he led him to composing symphonies. Dr. Sikori is about my age, and we grew up listening to the same type of music. And prior to his NDE, we shared the same musical talent. None. Right. However, after his NDE, he was able to compose these absolutely amazing classical symphonies. Why? Now, the standard neuroscientific answer to this question would be that the electrical shock rearranged the neurons in the part of his brain that deals with artistic expression. The neuroscientists would add, this is a process that we don't fully yet understand. Again, this would have been the answer that Dr. Alexander, the neurosurgeon, would have provided to one of his patients prior to his own NDE. Again, not now. He sees consciousness as a transcendent experience. That's why his book is entitled Proof of Heaven and not Proof of Scientific Dogma. NDEs show us that consciousness is far more than a biological creation within our brain. A couple years ago, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal by a neuroscientist stating that someday, it may be 100 years from now, but it will happen, that we'll be able to download our consciousness, our entire self, into a computer. The human brain is 80 to 90 billion neurons, so it may take a while. All of our knowledge, feelings, personality, and subjectiveness, all of us, this is how much the scientific community thinks, that we are entirely made of matter. In this case, the author goes on to state that we will have an afterlife in a computer, after our biological bodies perish. Really, that's an afterlife. This is sort of a reverse Matrix movie. He states we could even send ourselves in a computer off to a distant star in our galaxy since we would not be constrained by biological time. They treat human consciousness like a bunch of binary bits in a computer. If we are a bunch of aligned ones and zeros using electrons in our neurons, how come when someone has a cardiac arrest in a hospital and they place a defibrillator and then they zap the patient with 1,300 1, volts, why aren't all those electrons and neurons totally rearranged? We don't have surge protector in our brain. <laughs> the patient should wake up, you know, a different person or a zombie. But consciousness is not something created inside our head. It is far greater than that. Generally, all people who have near-death experiences describe how they feel connected to the universe and to everyone else. Dr. Alexander Bernardo Castro and others go on to state that perhaps our brain really is a filter between us and God. A filter between us and the center of all knowledge and energy of the universe. Then the perhaps people like Einstein or Beethoven, who could just sit down and write a complex symphony, their brains are filtering a little less. This is why Dr. Sequoia can now write complex symphonies. This is actually known as the savant effect. 
and it actually occurs after many near-death experiences, that they now have this ability to do unique, special, different things. The greatest scientific discovery of this century is the existence of the Higgs boson. It has been referred to as the God particle, which is a really bad name for it. Now, the Higgs boson only exists for like eh, 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 20th of a second. So what's the big deal? It actually it isn't the boson as much as it is the Higgs field. Is the idea of this universal field like electromagnetism and gravity that underlie the universe. The Higgs fields give certain particles their resting mass. But what we have seen through near-death experiences and quantum mechanics is that consciousness is fundamental. By that I mean more than the laws of physics and matter. This has been stated by others. But how fundamental? Electromagnetism, gravity, the Higgs field are all fields that deal with matter. But consciousness is more fundamental to the universe and our existence than fields of matter. I will suggest to you an entirely new way to look at consciousness. It is fundamental to what I would call God's consciousness field. This would be a field which we are all connected to God. As I just stated earlier, Everyone who has an NDE speaks of how they feel connected to the rest of humanity and spiritually to the divine. It is my belief that this universal consciousness field is the most important field of all in our universe. I describe this as God's consciousness field. We are connected to God and each other through the field. Perhaps the consciousness field is how the Holy Spirit is sent to us or how we can communicate to God in prayer. The consciousness of God is far greater than we can conceive of. Bernardo Castrop, a computer scientist, has a great metaphor for universal consciousness. Think of a river passing by you in, in any point in space and time. This river is universal consciousness. Occasionally, whirlpools form in the river. These whirlpools are you, your soul, your consciousness. All the water molecules within the whirlpool define the whirlpool yet they are still connected to all the other water molecules, the universal consciousness. At some point, the whirlpool disappears. Like the whirlpool, we die. But our soul, our consciousness, continues on, still connected to the universal consciousness, God's consciousness field. Other philosophers have used the analogy of waves crashing on a beach. The wave has its own particular height and shape, but once it hits the beach the way it washes back, it just becomes part of the ocean. Near-death experiences are our telescopes in the universe 2.0 and God's consciousness field. There are numerous studies I could cite, and it's a whole other lecture, but there just isn't time here, that confirm that consciousness is non-local. Studies into what one refers to as ESP, or psi, telekinesis, telepathy, shared near-death experiences, conscious effects on random number generators, even certain medical conditions. All are evidence that consciousness extends beyond the limit of our skin. A Gallup poll that has been done repeatedly for many decades confirmed that 30 to 35 percent of Americans have had a spiritual experience. This is not just that you heard a great sermon or went to a Bible study. By definition, this means the person had an experience of an altered state of consciousness. It could have religi religious implications or not, but in an altered state of consciousness, you can experience things like an NDE, for example, is an altered state of consciousness. One simple example of non-local consciousness that we could all relate to this is actually experimentally proven. You can sense when someone is staring at you. Well, unless, now, we don't have eyes in the back of your head, but unless you were a fourth grade teacher. I got in so much trouble, Linda probably did that. You know. but, you sense, but you sense something. This is an example of non-local consciousness sensation. In fact, snipers who are half a mile away from their targets report the target turning and looking right down their barrel. Probably a little too late in that case, but, but this again, non-local consciousness. So there are three 
takeaways from tonight. And this will help us in the next lecture. Consciousness extends beyond our ears. Consciousness is fundamental to the universe. And quantum mechanics implies that the universe is not as real as we think it is. Consciousness is non-local, not contained just within our head. And we are all connected to what I refer to as God's consciousness field. The second point deals with matter. The third, as I said, is not as real as we think it is. So where does all this discussion on consciousness lead us? Let's discuss how the majority right now of the scientific community views the universe. What I have here, hope you can all see this. This is a classic scientific hierarchy of the universe, what is known as determinism. Recall that Einstein thought quantum mechanics was incomplete. He wanted to believe the world was deterministic. Determinism is essentially cause and effect, which has evolved to reductive material, uni, materialism. The universe, including us, is made entirely of matter, and matter can be reduced to its simplest forms, thus reductive materialism. As a footnote, the, the physicist Roger Penrose in an interview once stated he does not like the term materialism because it implies we know what matter is made of. And yeah, we really don't. In this diagram, each layer is dependent upon the layer below it, and the others are independent of the one above it. So we have physics at the bottom here. Chemistry, as we learned you know, in high school, chemistry is dependent upon the valence electrons in the outer shell, and that's what makes compounds are stable or not is what the valence electrons are doing. So chemistry is dependent upon physics. Okay? Biology, our, you know, our body is made up of DNA, which is nucleic acids. You know, biology is just an assemblage of chemical compounds into the molecules that make us up. So biology is dependent upon chemistry, dependent upon physics. Our brain, to science, is simply just a biological thing that's been created through evolution. And from our brain, get, we get consciousness. Right. So each layer is dependent on the one below it, but independent of those above it. And this leads, again, to consciousness, which, again, according to our classic scientific community, is derived from our neurons or biological processes of our brain. But we don't understand. This is the universe, and this is life. Do you see God anywhere in here? This model of the universe? But what did we learn tonight about consciousness? So consciousness can affect the basic particles that make up the universe. So consciousness should really be down here, right? Because it affects the matter of the universe. And what we also learn that consciousness is really tied to what and to whom? Now what does this tell us? Now it tells us the entire universe is dependent upon God. All of human evolution and knowledge is dependent upon God. So, we learn this from consciousness. I'd like to wrap up the lecture tonight with one quote. Earlier in the lecture, I mentioned the brilliant Dutch physicist, George Lemaitre. I say he was brilliant because he originally went to school to study civil engineering. In 1920, he received his doctorate in science and mathematics. Einstein described his math as brilliant when he used Einstein's theory of general relativity and worked backwards to create the hypothesis of the primeval atom, what we now call the Big Bang Theory. I may have erred slightly when I originally described him to him. Eh, kind of my bad. I should have described him to you as Monsignor Lemaitre. This is a picture of Lemaitre with some guy who needs a haircut. You know, he's not wearing the Hollywood casting prescribed tweed coat with patches. After obtaining his doctorate in physics and math, he went on to seminary and became a priest. Lemaitre stated, 
I was interested in truth from the point of view of salvation as much in truth from the point of scientific certainty. It appeared to me that there were two paths to truth, and I decided to follow both of them. Lemaitre is saying there are two ways to understand the universe. I will suggest to you tonight, if we truly want to understand the universe, there's really only one path. And we'll explore that in our next lecture. Thank you.